I was going to make some notes here, but uh, I started and it too much work. And so forget that. So I'm just going to wing it the best I can. And I'm probably going to butcher even a few more things than I thought. But uh, too bad. No, I'm just kidding. I'm going to try to do my best here. Um, so I pull up yesterday on Upper Broadway, a half a block from the Broadway gate, which is my little theory as to where Zodiac would have, uh, you know, would have been a, you know, possibly parked the getaway vehicle. I mean, certainly one good option if he'd scouted out the area. And anyway, get out of the vehicle. I, you know, close the door, look up and boom, what's right in front of me? What am I parked right just 10 feet away from? Uh, Melvin Belli's house, if you can believe it. So, I mean, those of you that are familiar with the case, he was a, he was a more, a little bit more than a bit player at one point in the case. Zodiac wrote him a letter and asked for help and may have been serious. And then there was a radio, a, a call in TV show, the Jim Dunbar show. And it, I think turned out to be a fake guy, but the letter was real for sure. He included a piece, unfortunately, of the cab driver's shirt in there. And uh, at the time, though, Belli lived on Telegraph Hill. So Belli moved into this house in the late 70s. But then he lived here for probably, you know, 20 years or something like that. And I think it's changed hands a few times. I think at one point it ended up being owned by the CEO of Yahoo. If I, I could be wrong on that. But this is the Gold Coast. This three-block section. We'll talk about that a little more. It's kind of known as Billionaire's Row in San Francisco. One of the richest three block stretches in the country, if not the richest, actually, um, you know, inch inch by inch. But uh, isn't that it's kind of uh, amusing uh, that actually the first first place I see on my little walking tour is Melvin Belli's house. And he was actually a flamboyant attorney, represented some interesting people such as uh, the Rolling Stones, Muhammad Ali, I believe even you know, Starlets, Mae West, Zsa Zsa Gabor. And one thing I didn't know about Belli uh, initially was that he actually represented Jack Ruby. And Ruby, for those of you on the younger side, Ruby shot Lee Harvey Oswald on live TV in 1963, either one or two days after Ruby or after Oswald was accused of assassinating President John F. Kennedy. And Ruby was a mobster, it turned out, in Dallas, a, a reputed mobster. Uh, the, you know, the soft story was he was a fan of Kennedy and was upset about the assassination and took things into his own hands. But then it came out later that, uh, you know, he, he was likely connected with the mob and then the, the conspiracy theorists, you know, it figured for all these years that the mob had something to do with Kennedy's assassination. And so Ruby might have been trying to silence Oswald at that point. But in any case, he was charged with murder for that, needed an attorney. So who defended him? Melvin Belli. So this, this guy's kind of all over the place. Now, half a block from Belli's house are the Lion Street steps. And look at that commanding view. And uh, even I think Diane Feinstein lives down those steps, the, the California, longtime California senator. But just next to those steps is what we're getting at. This is a Presidio gate. So I'm going to reverse this. Now, I'm going the opposite direction that a killer on the loose that night might have gone, who would have exit, exited this gate, got into a vehicle maybe across the street from Belli's house, and then driven away. But I'm going the opposite way. This gate is on Broadway. At the time, in 1969, it was open to car traffic, but it was very little used, and they closed it in the early 70s to car traffic uh, because right around the corner is the Presidio Avenue gate to the Presidio, and that was much, uh, you know, much, much busier. It's more of a thoroughfare, et cetera. But even back then, the little side gate was open for walkers, and there weren't many of them, but that was, uh, you know, the way to get out of the Presidio at that point especially at night. No, nobody would see you. It would just it'd pitch black, pretty much. Very quiet street. This street's much quieter than 
Presidio Heights, as you'll as you'll see, and um, it just has more of a remote feel to it. But it would be actually the perfect place to park a getaway car, and then make your way out of the Presidio to the vehicle, get in the vehicle, and you're and you're gone. Man, a little bit closer shot of that gate. And this is from just, if you just came out of the gate and you're looking at Broadway, now you're looking east. And if you go three blocks, if you drove three blocks, sort of to where that tall building is on the right, that's to Visadero. You turn left down to Visadero, and then that puts you right on the approach to the Golden Gate Bridge. It's a very easy escape. And again, if you were parked, for instance, where that silver vehicle is, or even a little bit closer to the fire hydrant, you're just feet from the that the Presidio gate, the little walking gate. And these blocks are very quiet. Um, they're so wealthy that the houses on the right, many of them occupy the whole block, and you enter them a block over on Pacific Avenue. So they have the house has the whole lot. Either the house extends back, or it's set back or there's a big backyard. But the bottom line is very few of them do you enter on Broadway from the on this where that where the sidewalk is where the cars are parked and a little motorbike. And they're so big and wealthy that they take up a whole square block in San Francisco. Most of the entrances are actually on Pacific. So that makes it even more remote and more quiet. It's become a tourist destination during the day because of those Lion Street steps and that view. So you get these little uh, tourist buses, mini buses, sometimes even the double-decker buses will pull up with tourists. But, uh, you know, once it gets dark, it, it, it's dead quiet here. Now you're inside the gate looking up, if you were going to be exiting. And again, now deeper into the Presidio, we're, we're going backwards on this walk towards Julius Kahn Playground. We're reversing what a killer might have done. This was double the thickness, this, this pavement. Now it's turned into a footpath uh, type of thing, but it was double wide for vehicles to drive up in those days. There's another shot of it. And just uh, to your, if you look off to your left, right at that same point, look at the view. Yeah, look where you are. So you've got... Uh, you know, Marin County across the way, you've got Alcatraz would be out in the middle of the bay to the right, and the Golden Gate Bridge would be to the left. So the Presidio is quite an impressive spot. It's it's really the, the last remnant of old San Francisco, undeveloped San Francisco, the way it, the way it, it was probably, you know, several hundred years ago. And just a little understanding of the woods that we're talking about here, that someone could could disappear into very, very easily. Now, closer to Presidio Boulevard, which is the the main drag coming through the Presidio, uh, you're looking up. So you're further down the little lane from the Broadway gate. Now you're all the way down. This is Presidio Boulevard coming in, which in 1969 was part of an army base, the U.S. Army. Had, the Presidio was a base, and this was, the, you know, Vietnam, it was a very serious, active place. And there was Letterman Hospital, a lot of returning veterans, uh, you know, were being cared for at Letterman Hospital. Or not, yeah, Letterman Hospital, right, in the Presidio. But if you look to the left, we're now about, just about 50 to 75 yards into the Presidio. So from the, if you, from the right... 50 yards away, 60, 70 yards away is the gate, the, the Presidio Avenue gate. You come through that gate, you just cross this little crosswalk, and then out of the picture to the left, you make a, a sharp left turn and you double back so that now you're going back actually south, almost direct south again. You're reversing direction because you're coming north into the Presidio. Now you're going back south. That loops you back to Julius Kahn Playground. That is most likely the way the motorcycles came flying into the Presidio that night. They came right past this little intersection, this little foot crossing, and they made a left, a sharp, almost a U-turn doubling back down to Julius Kahn Playground, and we'll see where that is. 
And the Zodiac would have just waited him out in the woods and then calmly crossed over here. This is this is pitch black. There are no lights anywhere. Crossed over, gone up the little lane, which is about one block long to get to that Broadway gate. Very dark street, got into the vehicle and was gone. More just examples of being in the woods. Now, here's where you, they would double back. And there's footpaths and all kinds of stuff. But the road... For car, vehicles, motorcycles is the paved part to the left. And you can see in the distance Presidio Heights, the, the houses of Presidio Heights through the trees. Now, walking around in the woods a little bit, you can, again, you get a glimpse of a house. And that house would be right on the Presidio Wall. So that would be on Pacific Avenue, the civilian side of the wall. And then just on, on this side of the wall would be the military side. That's West Pacific. But again, just to, just to show you, you can be very close to those houses, but be remote, but, no, but nowhere near as remote as you really could be in these woods when you, get, when you see the full scope of the woods. I keep stressing these woods because I've seen people state that there's no way Zodiac could have survived in those woods. He could, couldn't have hidden in the woods with all the police presence. He absolutely could have. You could, you could live in those woods. Uh, if you're, you, you could pitch a tent in those woods and nobody would find you. And obviously they had dogs and they had searches, but they were really going the other direction. They were going between Julius Kahn Playground and Ar the Arguello Gate. They were not searching these exact woods. He could have stayed there all night, probably. But he certainly could stay there long enough to wait for all the chaos and confusion and the motorcycles as it passed, and then just calmly go the other way. And that's, I, I believe, what he did. If he didn't live in Presidio Heights. I mean, that's the other theory. If he was not, if he was not a resident of Presidio Heights... This would be my guess. A little clearing, but again, in the woods. And a lot of sand in here. This is, again, old, probably original San Francisco. Sand. Sandy foundation. Look at this. Look at how remote you are in here. You can barely see... Again, on top of the trees, a little bit off center, there's a house. And that, again, would be Presidio Heights. And again, off to the right at an angle, sort of a diagonal to the right, would be the crime scene. Probably about a mile from this point. Look at this. Now, this I show this because this used to be woods and they cleared it. Even by clearing this large area, there's a tremendous amount of, of woods. Somebody could commit the same crime, I hate to say it, now with all kinds of you know surveillance cameras and everything else. You could commit the same crime and escape the same way and hide the same way and get away with it, unfortunately. You know, because this is very raw territory. They're, this is a protected little area. They're trying to replant some stuff and fence it off, one of those things. And uh, you can see, again, that's... Those houses are right on Pacific on the other side of the wall. But the other reason I show this is now that you got coyote awareness. This to, to demonstrate the Presidio is a raw place. There are mountain lions running around in there. Now you got coyotes, the warning dog walkers. I think there might have been a bear sighting in there at one point in the last couple of years. It's raw. It's the rawest part of San Francisco, one of the really one of the rawest parts of the inner bay area. People don't realize that. It was an army base, but the base was concentrated in a couple of areas. The rest of it is just raw. Raw territory, and it's not very different now than it was when the army occupied it. The army started to move out of there in the 70s. Now you're looking, uh, you're looking east, up the hill, but again... The Zodiac would have been to the left in those woods. And now as you get close to the wall, close to Pacific Avenue, again, a view from the just ducking into the woods of the uh, houses. Pacific and Laurel. And by the way, that wall, I'll mention a few times, it's three and a half or four feet high. It's an old wall. And again, it was uh, military on one side, civilians on the other. You had the military police patrolling the inside. No, the San Francisco police did not patrol the inside. It was the military police. If you, and they were strict. Parking, speeding, all that stuff, much, much deeper penalties. 
But the ironic thing is, you had all the, even all those years ago, you had a city playground, a San Francisco city playground, Julius Kahn playground, within the grounds of the U.S. Army Presidio Army base. And I don't know how that ever came about, but it's the same way today. Now it's it's no it's a it's the U.S. National Seashore, I believe, protected. The army has nothing to do with it now, but. Still the same thing. You have a city playground right on the grounds. And that was Julius Kahn. Just a, a just a glimpse of the woods from West Pacific. Right here is where the motorcycles would have been zooming by. They would have come into the Presidio, made that double back left turn, almost like a U-turn, and now they'd be zooming to the left here, which is going west, towards the entrance to Julius Kahn playground where everybody was amassing. The police, detectives, dogs whatever else. And the woods off to the right, and they're quite extensive. And Zodiac would be in those woods, just kind of watching it all happen. Now you're getting a little closer to Julius Kahn, and you can see the back of the Little League field. That All that green is Julius Kahn playground. City of San Francisco playground, Even again, even when the Army occupied the Presidio. There's a few houses over here right on the other side of the wall as you get close to Julius Kahn. The reason I point them out is I had a friend that lived in one of these. And I can't recognize it anymore because they keep painting them and renovating them, facelifting them. I'm not sure which house it was. It's one of a couple different ones. I kind of lost touch with the guy. But just a couple of years ago, I asked him, when I, when I got interested again in the case, I asked him, hey, did you see anything that night? You know, I mean, miraculously, what if the guy said, yeah, I looked out the window, I saw some guy running across the lawn. I mean, it could have, it could have happened, but he said he didn't. But then later in the night, they heard commotion, so they did look out the window, and they saw busloads of um, army buses with, full of soldiers with M16s patrolling up and down. And so again, when you, you think about it, at the time they, I mean, it was a serious enough crime, but the magnitude hadn't been established. They thought it was a, it was a strong arm cab robbery gone bad and where the cab driver unfortunately perished and so they put a lot of manpower on it but they didn't approach it that night like it was the zodiac they didn't know that for a few days um so that was interesting that they had the the you know the army patrolling it but what they should have done in in hindsight you would think and here's another house might have been the guy's house I, I, they, again i can't quite tell which one it was but what they should have done in hindsight was immediately have the, you had the U.S. Army to work with. You had them at your disposal. Have them secure the perimeter of the Presidio. At the very least, have them secure the gates, the, just the gate accesses. Because you could drive in and out of the Presidio. It's not like many bases where there's a little guard booth and you got to check in and anything else. Anybody could drive in at any time, day or night. Um, you, you'd be suspicious. Maybe if, if you're a civilian driving around in here at night, you might, you know, you might attract attention but late at night, but uh, there were no restrictions, but you could, you could at least put, you could man the gates so that if you had a criminal trying to get out of the Presidio, he at least couldn't get out one of the gates. He'd have to climb a fence or climb a wall or do something, uh, put him more conspicuous. And so that's the first thing, just secure the gates, but they didn't, they didn't do that. Okay, this is on the Little League field. Uh, it just gives you a sense that, that where you are. The Golden Gate, there's the Tower of the Golden Gate Bridge. I guess that's the uh, the South Tower. And the Golden Gate Bridge actually does, where you come out on the San Francisco side, that really is in the Presidio. It's connected to the Presidio from Marin County. And, of course, if you got on the bridge, there you, you're going north, I believe. One, that's 101. I think it goes... All the way to Oregon, it might go all the way to Canada. And there's just a Saturday afternoon, people lounging around. In our day, nobody ever sat on the grass like that. We we were playing sports all day. They they would have got trampled. You know, get out of the get out of the grass. You know, don't sit in the middle of the grass. So that was a football field. They're sitting in the football field. But kids don't play sports spontaneously anymore. It's all organized. So even that, you know, walking around all day, I didn't see any kids throwing a ball around. We, we were, 
you know, I mean, it's te- always tempting to say the old days were better, but we we played from morning till it got dark. We, we were playing sports at Julius Kahn growing up. They, these people wouldn't have gotten away with just picnicking right in the middle of a field. Sorry. <laughs> okay, a few more shots. Little League field. You get a sense now of the woods behind it. My thought is Zodiac crosses the, the Little League field and then disappears into the woods, and that's it. Until he gets to the Broadway gate. And here's an example. There's several little holes right in the in the brush. This is this would be the the uh, first baseline, and the, so this is kind of right field of the of the little league field. Out right field, the grass, and then right at the edge of the grass, there's a hole, and you're gone. Your your history, nobody's gonna find you there. Another view of it. This is Julius Kahn from the very uh, far corner. This would be the north. Geez, a little blank here, but this would be the north uh, east corner of Julius Kahn Playground, the far northeast corner. And if you just turn around from where the camera is, you're, then you're in the you got the woods staring you in the face. And if you just continued that direction, if you turned around and just continued that direction, now you're going east. You end up at the Broadway Gate, probably about a. I mean, you're zigzagging through the woods, but as a crow flies, it's probably about a half a mile. More expanse of the field. Now, this corner, this would be, of that big field, this would be the northwest corner. There used to be a hole in the fence back in the day. Back in 1969, there was a hole in the fence. All this brush, but there was a hole in the fence. The reason I wanted to take a look here, because there was a police report that came out years ago. They hired a consultant. And the consultant put together a big report as to the spots where the Zodiac might have parked a vehicle, a getaway vehicle. And one spot they suggested was a possibility. They weren't as smart as me, by the way. They didn't come up with Broadway. That's that's the logical spot. But one, one spot they suggested as a possibility was down below this fence in the Presidio proper, uh, where there used to be an actual a Little League field for the Presidio kids. These are for Army for army families, um, kind of career army families, where the families lived with the off with the soldier, the officer in the presidio, and then their kids had activities such as little league, and they had a nice field. It was nicer than the one we had at J.K. But next to that field were a couple of parking spots, just a couple, and um, this SFPD report suggested they may have that Zodiac may have parked there. And then just cut through, cut across this field, and in essence, cut through that hole in the fence at that point, and just gone down a little hill, a little kind of a little dirt, negotiate a little dirt hill, and then the car parked at the bottom near that little league field, and pretty remote, et cetera, and gotten away. The, the, what I don't like about that idea is the MPs, again, were very strict. And if you didn't have a sticker on your vehicle, you attracted attention, either got a ticket, got towed. They waited till you came back. They kept an eye. It was not not wise. If you didn't have a military sticker of some sort or, or you know permission to park anywhere in the Presidio, you were in trouble. So, in other words, if somebody parked there in the afternoon or early evening and then you know walked out of the Presidio, took a bus or cab downtown to Geary and Mason, and then came back, committed the crime, he premeditated, and then with the idea of getting back into the vehicle. That's a lot of hours for a, a civilian vehicle to sit there. Probably get scrutinized. It, it probably probably wouldn't have been wise. Um, but I wanted to take a look back there anyway, and it's changed completely. They've they fancied the whole thing up. Here's here's a little more Julius Kahn. But before I get down to the back, look at these woods again. Look for the corner of Julius Kahn. This is a, right about where that night the police would have amassed with the dogs. This is the entrance to Julius Kahn Playground. The dogs, the detectives, the motorcycle cops. This is where they would have gathered and then fanned out and started looking. But look at the woods. That's where that's where he would, would have been. And they didn't go that way. They went the other way. They went back the, the direction, the, the opposite direction we're looking. We're looking east. They went west between Julius Kahn and the Arguello Gate. That's my understanding. That's mainly where they looked. So even with the dogs, they didn't, you know, they didn't enter the woods where the Zodiac would have been hiding. 
And I take him at his word. He talked about being in the woods and uh, watching the motorcycles go by, and it makes sense. And I'm, I, I'm quite sure, again, if he didn't live in Presidio Heights, which is another theory people have, but if he didn't, I believe I, I take that part of his letter at his word. And look at those woods. There's more view. Look at, look at how extensive it is. There's part areas where it almost feels like you're up at Tahoe in the Sierras in forests. Very rugged. You can get lost in there. You could, like I said, you could live in there. They wouldn't find you. Okay. So now coming around the back of that fence, though, just to see if that was a viable option to park down below. Let's take a look. Now they've fancied the whole thing up. They've got soccer fields down there with artificial turf. I think they've got lights so they can have night games. And they have this little parking area, this whole parking lot for those fields. But this is where SFPD suggested at one point that Zodiac might have parked the getaway vehicle. You could have parked about two or three cars down here. There's just a little patch. And this was, again, if you if you cross Julius Kahn, the football field, cut through the fence that night in the dark, negotiated a little dirt hill in the dark, and got in your vehicle here, and then you just figured out you got you figured out one of the exits and you, you drove out of the Presidio. I don't think I don't think it happened that way, but I wanted to check it out. Okay, here's again the entrance to Julius Kahn. This is where it all happened. This is where they, they've, you know, they came together that night. Search party, whatever you want to call it. Um, again, you're looking, you're looking east, up, up Pacific Avenue. Another view. Look at the woods. Not a lot of distance. Once you enter Julius Kahn, if you're hustling, Maybe 90 seconds, you're in the woods. You've crossed the Little League field, you're, you're gone. Crosswalk from, from uh, not exactly Spruce, but let's just take a look here. Spruce is just a little ways up. And, and by the way, this parking, there's, they've changed it. They used to only have space for about maybe eight cars, and you parked head in towards the wall. And that was legitimate if you were using the playground. The Army, the MPs left you alone. Now they've changed it where they've opened up that whole shoulder for parking. And they have birthday parties and things like that there. People drive. People used to just walk from the neighborhood the way it should have been. Now people drive here. But what I'm getting to is he couldn't have parked there at night back in 1969. Couldn't have, that couldn't have been the getaway spot because, again... You're not allowed to park there in the evening. Once the, once Julius Kahn closed down, you, you were not allowed to park a civilian vehicle there. So that would have attracted the same attention as one down below with no sticker. It, it wouldn't have, it wouldn't have made sense. Uh, you know, you think about getting into your vehicle right here. Neighbors aren't used to hearing anybody at night getting into a vehicle in, or they weren't in those days, especially in the darkened uh, you know parking area of Julius Kahn. People would look at just, and then you're driving up that hill, right past where all the motor motorcycles are coming, rushing into the sea of the other direction. So that wouldn't have made sense, in my opinion, as a getaway. You might have gotten away with it, you might have pulled it off, but that wouldn't have been a smart getaway to just park as somebody who's using Julius Kahn Playground, and you're probably the only vehicle there once it got dark. You get in the vehicle, and then you drive out past the onrushing police presence. Probably not, probably there are better ways. The better way is get in the woods and just make your way slowly and carefully up to the Broadway gate, which is about a half mile away, and you're gone. Okay, Pacific and Spruce. You have an entrance here. This is the main entrance the neighborhood people would use to get to the Presidio. There's that little opening on the side. Now, it wasn't as big. This is looking coming down the hill from Jackson. Bottom of the hill from Jackson. Now you're Pacific, um, and you're still just on the civilian side of the wall. There was a metal gate, I'm pretty positive back then, or some kind of a bar, something that shrunk that area down. I think it was a gate that swung and it was open, but it just, it made the air, it made it smaller. And I, I'm not even, I, something tells me the, the, those walls were different too. They came together a little closer. My point being, uh, there's been some theories that the motorcycle, that some of the motorcycles came through here and I'm not sure they could have fit. I'm just, I'm not sure about that back then, but I did run into a guy, an 85 year old guy 
retired SF motorcycle cop. And I asked him, and he, he, he not sure if he was completely on top of what I was asking. He, he, he was on the job during that time, but he wasn't working that night. And I asked him where they came, and he said most of them, I, I, if I got it correctly, they, they rushed in the Presidio Avenue gate. And that would have been consistent with the way the Zodiac seemed to describe it. But I pressed him. I said, anything else? He said, yeah, a few of them came Arguello, the Arguello gate. And I kept pressing him. I said, do you know the, spru- you know, the spruce little opening? And he said, yeah, they, a few of them might have gone through there. I wasn't convinced he, he definitely knew the opening. But I have to take him at his word that he acknowledged that some of the motorcycles might have come down spruce and gone through here. So look at that wall, civilian side. Now, as you start walking up, you're still on the military side. You're in the Presidio. You're leaving Julius Kahn. You're going up to the Arguello Gate. This is the back of Maple Street. And it doesn't look like much. The wall doesn't look like much either here. But again, it's about four, four and a half feet high. Uh, The photos are a little deceptive. I'm not sure that bar stuff was there back then. You might have just been able to hop right over the wall. But the point being, if if you haven't scouted out the area, you're you're walking down Jackson and you want to get away and you look to the left, you see this little horseshoe-shaped cul-de-sac on Maple. You have no idea that that goes through. and It's pitch black. There might be one little street light, but it's very faint. And there's trees. You have no idea if that will get you through to the, to the Presidio unless you've scouted it out. And it sounds like you know, the, the officer's testimony that, I mean, they've, you know, they kind of changed the story a few times, it seems like, but it sounds like they, they thought the Zodiac was heading down Maple into the Presidio. So, which would imply that he knew, he, he knew it, he'd scouted it out. Or he was local. There's a longer view of it. Now, walking up further towards the uh, Arguello Street gate, and this path is probably where uh, the dogs and the police fanned out and started looking. But again, they were searching basically the wrong direction. Because look at those woods off to the right. Look, look how, Again, this is where it starts looking almost like you're in Tahoe. That's where the Zodiac was. The woods in the distance, and they're coming up this way towards the Arguello Gate. They, 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 wouldn't, they couldn't know, but it sounds like that's what happened. More of the same. Now you're getting close. You're looking up the hill now. And the top of the hill is going to be where the Arguello Gate is. But before you get there, right across the road, now this is the back of Cherry Street. So someone could also cut straight up from Washington to Jackson and then just continue straight this little half block cul-de-sac. Um... And that, those steps, it's deceptive. It looks like there's a little pit there, but they actually go right to the top of the wall. And then you just, you hop down off the wall into the, now you're in the Presidio, but you're a little bit, uh, west now of Julius Kahn. You're, you're not under as much cover now. You're a little more exposed there until you get to Julius Kahn. But again, he could have done it that way if somebody wanted to, to cut through Cherry. Same thing at night. You look that direction. You're looking north on Cherry, and you just, you can't tell. It looks like a couple of houses. You have no idea that it cuts through unless you've scouted it out. There it is again. And there's a fuller view of it, the back of Cherry Street. This is, again, looking back down towards Julius Kahn from very close to the top of the hill, now the Arguello Street gate. Now, this is where the police would have rushed in from Arguello. And I guess the story being that Officer Falk uh, was was told they were supposed to be looking for a black male and actually may have stopped the Zodiac and asked him, did he see somebody? And then literally a minute later, maybe even less, the call was changed. The dispatch was changed. They made a mistake looking for a white male. He realized that might have been the guy. But instead of turning around and go, and going back to Maple or Spruce down Jackson where he saw him, he probably anticipated by that point the guy had hustled into the Presidio, and this would be the faster way. So Falk then went to Arguello, the opposite way, went up Arguello a block into the gate and then made a 
immediate right turn and went flying down this exact road now toward JK. JK is about a quarter mile down this road to East Con Playground. So this is where Falk entered the Presidio in pursuit. And that's the exact gate. It says Presidio. It doesn't say Arguello anywhere that I see, but this is the Arguello Avenue gate. If you back it down now a block, now you're at Jackson and Arguello. And if you turn around and look up the hill, that's the gate. It's a very short block from Jackson and Arguello to the gate. You make a right turn at the stop sign, and then you make an immediate right again. If you don't make the second right, you're heading toward the main base of the Presidio, which is at least a mile away, probably maybe almost maybe a couple of miles, the main army presence. But if you make that right and then a sharp right, now you're paralleling right along the wall, the inner, inner part of the wall. You're actually on West Pacific heading down towards Julius Kahn Playground. Right here at this spot, this photo spot, you're two blocks from the crime scene. Down a block to Washington and over a block to Cherry. So you're two blocks away. Jackson and Cherry. Now you've gone down, uh, or you've gone in one block. You've walked west on Jackson one block from that last shot. Now you're at Cherry. And again, you, here's that view. This is even a daytime view. It's hard to tell that you can cut through if you're trying to cut through Cherry to the Presidio. But here's those steps. On the far right, there are steps. And they go down, and again, it looks like the wall just meets the, uh, it's, it's a kind of an optical illusion, but it's you know four, four and a half feet high to get down to the road there. There it is again. And again, to the right is Julius Kahn Playground down the hill. One Cherry Street, that's uh, an impressive address to have. And this is some kind of a mansion right at Jackson and Cherry. And apparently the witnesses' parents, the teenage witnesses' father was a prominent physician. And that night was actually at a function. I think the parents were at a function just a block away to show you the kind of affluence in, in Presidio Heights. And I think it was the Belgian consulate. I could be wrong on that. And it might have actually been this building. It was certainly right at this, at this intersection, one, one of the houses right here. Now we're at the crime scene, and this is Kitty Corner from the witness's house. Directly diagonal. Cherry Street is to the right. Cherry Street runs off to the right, to, to the north. And Washington goes to the left, one, one block to Arguello. From the witness's front curb, looking at the crime scene. Still always kind of, even after all these years, it's, it's eerie. And, it's, and there's a sadness to it as well. There's the witness's house. And look at the proximity. Look at, if, you know, Mike Rodelli wrote a great book, one of the best true crime books I've ever read, and whether you embrace his suspect or not, he goes into a lot of detail on the witnesses, and he's interviewed them, and et cetera. And that, that night is very clear in his book. And, and there were, you know, teenagers, they were sharp kids. They had 20-20 vision. Uh, and one of them went downstairs, turned off the light and watched from downstairs with the light off to get even a better view. And look how close he would be to the, to the scene right there. And this gives you one more view of it. Just a little ways down Cherry looking and see how close everything is. This neighborhood, the houses were built up right to the, to the sidewalks. Not like a lot of Fancy neighborhoods where you have, you know, long looping driveways or garages in front and that type of thing. The houses were right on the street and the street wasn't very narrow. Uh, they weren't built very narrow. You have cars parked on both sides and then you're driving and you have uh, somebody coming toward you the other way. You got to be careful. It's not a lot of room. But anybody that challenges the eyewitnesses account, uh, they have to look at these pictures. I mean, th this is pretty compelling here. It's very close. They're right on top of it. If the guy's over there taking his time trying to prop up the cab driver and then, you know, and ripping off part of the shirt and then uh, wiping things down, he's right there, right in view. 
this is a block up Maple and uh, Washington, where the original location was supposed to be. Just to give it, number one, to give an example of the affluence in the neighborhood. Look at this place. This is some sort of a landmark, but as a native San Franciscan, I have never heard of it, and I bet most people haven't. But part of the reason some people theorize that location was originally chosen, if the Zodiac knew the neighborhood, is because this was quiet. This house was only manned by a caretaker at that point, maybe not even by a caretaker. And across the street, slightly up the block, was a school. So it was, a, it was a, just a quiet area. There it is, Maple and Washington, right there. And it was, it was a, a relatively quiet spot for this neighborhood. And look down this hill. See a steep hill going down to Jackson. This is Maple Street going down to Jackson. And again, one theory is that the Zodiac would assume, you know, with that steep hill, people aren't going to be wanting to walk the dogs up up that hill, probably the steepest hill in the neighborhood. So less chance of somebody just strolling by or looking out of a house. That may have been part of the original plan to select that location. Okay, now we're back on Jackson, going down the hill. And this would have been the Zodiac's escape. He went up the hill to Cherry, made a right turn, and he's going down. And this would have been where the officers encountered him. Jackson and Maple. And this is the back of Maple, where probably the Zodiac cut through that night. And again, you can't tell, especially at night. You have no idea that it goes through. But on the far right is a little sidewalk, a thin sidewalk under the trees, and that does go back to the Presidio Wall. And there it is. I don't think they had that railing there back then. But either way, it doesn't matter. You, you, even now, you go around the railing or under it and you just drop over the wall. And then you're slightly west of Julius Kahn Playground. This is the way neighborhood people enter Julius Kahn Playground in the Presidio. Go down this hill on the sidewalk and there's that little opening, that permanent opening that used to be a gate. Where again, maybe... This, some or other motorcycles came through that night, but this is the bottom is the end of the very end of Pacific Avenue. It's where Pacific Avenue ends, and on the other side is West Pacific. So you walk down this hill, get to the bottom, and there's your opening. This 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 is shot now from the other side. Again, I was trying to figure out if these are the original posts because it they feel it feels like there's more space there, and I'm quite sure there was a gate, and I'm just not positive motorcycles could have made it through there. Okay, this is the entrance to Presidio. This is on Presidio Avenue, the entrance to uh, the Presidio. And this is most likely where the motorcycles came flying in that night, up Presidio Avenue, into the Presidio, and it changed the name to Presidio Boulevard, and making that very quick left turn and doubling back towards Julius Kahn. So here they are. That yellow sign is off to the right. If you go up that little one block hill, that takes you out the Broadway gate. That was the beginning of the video. We came backwards down from there, but that would be the escape route there. You go just slightly past that little foot intersection and then you double back. And here's what it looks like. Now you're doubling back and you can see in the distance, you know, a lot of Presidio Heights, a lot of the houses. You're doubling back. You're continuing doubling back. You're getting around the turn, you're racing through, and now you're in the straightaway, and there's Julius Kahn, quarter mile down. The bottom of the hill is Julius Kahn, where most of those cars are parked. Meanwhile, the Zodiac is off into the deep woods to the right. Motorcycles are zooming by, and he's in the woods. Those are the woods, beginning of the woods right there. Now, just one further thing. It was getting dark. These aren't as good photos, but... I went downtown. This is Geary and Mason where he would have gotten picked up if that was accurate near the current theater. And part of the reason I'm doing this, I, there, I believe the cab took a slightly different route than has been characterized. So you go, the, the idea is you just go up a, a block, turn on Taylor, go up Taylor, go up the hills. There's uh, There's Mason. But you go, uh, again, a block, turn on Taylor, go up a, bl you know, a block. You've got Geary, you got Post, now you got Sutter. 
push, and now you turn on pine. Now we're on pine, we're going west. The reason I'm showing this, demonstrating this, is pine. Locals know that pine is your is the way to go when you're coming from downtown to the outer neighborhoods. It's the only way to go. I've read all these accounts. People they took California Street, took Washington Street all the way. No, none of that stuff. Any knowledgeable cab driver would take pine. Uh, you take pine. The reason you take pine is it's three lane. It was back then the same thing. Three lanes one way, and the lights are synchronized. So on a Saturday night, if you get a little lucky, but you keep your speed up, you could theoretically make it from Taylor, which is one just one block from Mason. So you're talking about about four from about four blocks from where he picks up the Zodiac. You turn onto Pine. You could make it from there all the way to Presidio Avenue if you were lucky sometimes without hitting one single stoplight. That's that's pretty amazing. That's probably you know three or four miles easy without a without a stoplight uh, because they're synchronized. So if you stay on it, you don't have you know some guy double parked or somebody causing trouble, or whatever. You might get lucky and you make it. You might hit one at Van S no matter what. But again, that's why you take Pine. That's the only way to go. So you're getting closer. There's Pine Street. Pine Street. Now you're crossing Buchanan. You're getting closer to Fillmore. A couple more blocks. You can hit Presidio Avenue. Now you've hit Presidio Avenue and you turn. And you turn. But what do you do? This is, again, different than I've seen it portrayed. You turn. You get to California. One block to California. Pine is one block from California. So you've turned on Presidio Avenue, go one block to California. What do you do in California? What would any knowledgeable cab driver do? You stay on the big thoroughfares. You don't screw around with the little dinky side streets until you have to. He's going to Washington and Maple at this point. You turn on California. You don't dink your way up Presidio Avenue to Washington block by block and traffic and single lane stuff. Then you tough to make the left turn. Then you make the left turn. And then you're going one block at a time through a residential neighborhood with a stop sign on it pretty much every corner. You don't do it that way. You, you know, you might. If you're an inexperienced cab driver, maybe you would. Hard to see any cab driver not taking Pine Street. It's possible when you got to this point, you might go straight or you're involved in conversation or something, get distracted. But I don't, I don't think so. And a knowledgeable cab driver would make the left on California. You got two lanes each direction. It's a thoroughfare. It's a main street. It's a main street in San Francisco. And you take that to Maple. You turn right on Maple. Now you're going north on Maple. And at this point, you've gone two blocks. California to Sacramento to Clay. And then you keep going. And now you hit Washington and Maple. You hit Washington and Maple going north. I'm not sure anybody's ever characterize it that way. That's the way it would have happened. And I don't know if it makes any difference at all, but I want to set that record straight. You would hit Washington and Maple Street coming north, which would require you then to make a left turn onto Washington. There's that big mansion on the corner. But you would now have to make a left turn onto Washington. If you weren't going to stop, there was some some reason why you didn't stop at Washington. You know, the person commandeered you to go another block or whatever it is. I mean, you didn't stop at Maple. You, you went to Cherry. That's fine. But the point is you would make the left turn and then go the extra block. And here's the extra block right here. And again, on the corner, it's getting dark, but there's the scene. The house on the far right is the crime scene. Um, backdrop, you know, it happened parked right in front of that house. On the left is the witness's house. That's it. Now, back to Broadway, the final thing. If you came out the gate, this is a daytime shot. But again, you come out the gate, it's very remote. It's surprisingly remote for any almost any part of San Francisco, believe it or not. Any almost You could pick almost any residential part of San Francisco, it would, and they would not be this remote. You have to take that from me, having grown up in the neighborhood. Um, you get in the vehicle, and you drive three blocks. If you look... On the, the right, there's a structure. You can see the high structure on the right at the end of the little road. That's three blocks. That's to Visadero. You make a left onto Visadero. You get on the bottom of the hill. And um, I mean, when I say the hill, it's like five blocks, but you're down at the bottom of the hill. 
and then you're on the approach to 101, which puts you right, the Golden Gate Bridge approach is right there, and you're gone. Your history. So this is a block in now to that drive, and it's getting darker. And two blocks in on the right, just to point out, this was Francis Ford Coppola's house when he directed The Godfather. So he he lived there at the time, lived there in the late 60s. And he, I think he might still own the house. But there's a lot of fancy people. Again, on this three-block stretch, I think you have Gordon Getty, Larry Ellison of Oracle, uh, the, the lot of and a lot of people that keep low profiles, but you know, there's major CEOs and and you know famous people that live on this three block stretch of Broadway called the uh, they call it the Gold Coast. But anyway, forgetting that, you get to the visit area, you turn down the hill, and again at the bottom of these hills now is Lombard Street. You make a left, and that puts you right on the bridge. I'd say from here to the, the Golden Gate Bridge. To, from this point to actually be on the bridge about five minutes five minutes probably about three three minutes in the city and two or three minutes on the approach and you're on the bridge going north and um, these are steep hills these are some of the steepest in the city look at how cars typically park the other way on these hills you got to be careful but anyway the bottom of the hill next block down this is the uh the house that was in the movie Bullet, Steve McQueen. They had a big cocktail party on that deck, that outside terrace, and then they started on the chase scenes up and down the hills, etc. Uh, it's just a little sidelight. And you just keep going, and there you are. And I think that pretty much wraps it up. And we're back to <laughs> back to the beginning, the Melvin Belli house on Upper Broadway. But anyway, thanks for joining me. And I probably, I'm sure I left out some tidbits, but I also probably threw in too many other things that you didn't want to hear. So um, that's about it. It was an interesting walk. Uh, it was kind of sobering. You know, again, after 48, 49 years, I'm hoping this this may be the year that the DNA finally, finally does the trick. I think the, the case has been, you know, tough on a lot of people, and I'm just... You know, guessing it's including people like the witness witnesses. You don't think of that, but it's been a been a tough case on a lot of a lot of people, families, victims, police, as well as witnesses. Okay, thanks for joining me, and we'll uh, we'll talk to you soon.